the executives of the movie that have worked two years plus to produce a public service. So I don't want to hear from nobody about nothing because you're going to go through me. All right? Nick Baby Love Music Incorporated. I am the consultant. I got beach. Forget about it. Miami largely ties into the history of Miami bass and really all Miami music. And Florida, well before it was a state, was really more of an obstacle for shippers. There was a coral surrounding all of the waters around Florida, so shippers, of course, would wreck on these. And this is something that pirates and scavengers took advantage of. And it really is indicative of the story overall. One of the most notable pirates to start was Black Caesar, who was actually black. He became a partner of Blackbeards later, but he is very notable in South Florida. That history, historical information is very important. So it's like a treasure out in the Keys, and I have a lot of the treasures. And the idea behind the pirates is that this isn't mythical, it's actuality. That is just a couple of hundred years ago at best. But ultimately, what made Florida State was when Congress voted upon it and they put a lighthouse there to prevent this, which changed the landscape greatly. But what developed Florida as a state was Henry Flagler, single-handedly. Flagler built the railroad down from Jacksonville, which was the southernmost point of the states. At first, St. Augustine, which he developed into a retreat for the rich, and then he expanded that further south initially to West Palm Beach. And when it was cold in winter in West Palm Beach, he took it to Miami. Now, the idea behind Flagler building Miami was that it was, it was built on the backs of former slave labor, who technically weren't even citizens. 
but they're building it for the rich. It's what creates the diaspora. We have the rich, wealthy playground, and you have ultimately the laborers. And the laborers get sent over town to live, which now that neighborhood is called Overtown. And Overtown was later morphed and shifted over to Liberty City. But during the teens, 20s, etc., this was the strict area that was then called Negro Town. And there's a bit of a sketchy history that's not so easy to research. But we all know that on Miami Beach, that was built by Carl Fisher just by literally dredging up sand and building a city out of nothing. Mobsters and others built their own luxury hotels, which come into the limelight of Miami's landscape. And this was partially, if not greatly, mob money. So at the end of the day, you have to question what foundation Miami is built on and what foundation Miami business is built on. The music industry is a business. Make no mistake about that. <laughs> Miami gets put on the musical map in 1948 when Henry Stone comes into town. Now, Henry Stone is one of the original round table of black music independent moguls. All black music in the 1940s was independent. There was no such thing as a major label for black music. In 1965, Henry Stone, maybe, maybe not. Brought down James Brown to record. Here's the thing about James Brown. In 1956, he had a hit. Please, please, please. His stage show becomes notorious, but he fades for a while. However, in 1965, when he comes to Criteria and records on Mac Emmerman and G. Parment's boards, he records what we call, I feel good. Of course, you can call it, I still got you. Massive hit, massive hit. James Brown uh, becomes a beacon for soul music what was once called R&B. And this really focuses on Miami. Miami is now a recording place. The story of TK was when Henry Stone hires Steve Alemo, a blue-eyed soul singer. This is a collaboration. Henry Stone being the giant planet in the solar system funding Steve Alemo, discovering Deep City, fostering Clarence Reed, discovering Betty Wright. Beautiful relationship. The irony of all this is Clarence Reed certainly was good at writing songs, but he wanted to be something else on his spare time, and that was Blowfly. Blowfly was an individual. Blowfly was X-rated, comedic, and entertaining. Blowfly was in a wrestling mask, but Clarence Reed made hits, and that's what matters to the record labels most. How I got started a long time ago was my father, my mother. They went to the music business. My father was a manager for a certain acts. This place called TK Records, and a guy named Henry Stone. And uh, make a long story short, my father used to take me there every day. Just come, come with your bass. I used to be a bass player. Come with your bass, come with your bass, come with your bass. What happened with TK was, see, I, they thought I was a genius. Because I, I, <laughs> what I used to do was, once, they let, I used to, once Henry said I can hang out in the studio, I had to okay. This guy named Clarence Reed, his name is Blowfly. He has a cult following in his own. He used to put his finger in my face with a big long fucking fingernail and long ass finger. And I'm talking about, bro, listen, the only person I smelled funky to him was George Clinton. <laughs> That's a funky smelling motherfucker. But anyway, he used to tell me, hey son, let me tell you something, you're never gonna get nowhere if you don't make a fucking step. He said, you use my office, you sleep in here, you wait, you go into Steve's office, you pry that door open, you climb over the thing, get into the table, go to the studio and practice. I was like, you sure, man? He said, yeah. So I started doing this and I started learning. Now let's reverse to the late 60s, early 70s. Atlantic Records was focusing on Eric Clapton and the Bee Gees. And Criteria Studio is considering big accounts, such as South Florida's huge Caribbean music influence. I'm talking Bob Marley. Even the Eagles passed through Criteria Studios to record there and make their home for a while. Jay Walsh and the Eagles have recorded here under the guidance of Bill Simzig. 461 Ocean Boulevard, uh, Eric Clapton album, was done in the studio here too. And currently it's the studio that's being used by the Bee Gees. And uh, we, we more or less fell in love with the place. Where we were staying, which is on this game bay, and now we own homes on this game bay. So I started hanging out with the Bee Gees, you know. And um, one day the Bee Gees came over with this thing called a DX7. They didn't know how to read the manual, so they left it there. So one night I grabbed it, because I used to work in the studio and do music, and you know, I grabbed it and I, I was able to read the manual. So the next day when the Bee Gees came through, I, I said, oh, that's easy. I said, 
<laughs> because the Japanese used to write manuals back then and the fucking like an, if you knew how to really read like you read real grammar in America that shit would fuck you up but see I wasn't I didn't know how to read real, real grammar so I didn't give a fuck so anyway that, that led to me hanging out in the BG studio as the 70s are taking a new form in music there's a little private spot in Miami by the name of Honey for the Bears Bo Crane is a key figure in Miami bass he was a disco DJ that had a lot of power and influence. I came down here to go to school at the University of Miami. And uh, I got my degree, and I was gonna go back to New York, because I'm from New Jersey, back to New York or to LA to uh, make my way in the music business. But I kind of got stuck here because it's warm here. I was making a pretty good living right from the beginning, playing bass, doing arrangements and stuff like that. And I got involved in the music business right from not its infancy, but it's certainly its uh, early adolescence, at the time when TK was really happening and disco was coming to the fore. And that was the other thing that I was doing. I was a disc jockey, um, both at first on the radio. I was a uh, disc jockey uh, and morning man at WEDR 99 Jams. Nice. Yeah. I know you find that hard to believe, but I, yeah, that's right. I was there for a few years. Really, that's how I got to know everybody in, in, the, in the urban music scene. As the morning man and as the music director, I got to see all the promotion people and the artists and all the people involved in the record labels. So when it came time for me to make the leap from uh, being a radio disc jockey to getting more involved on the other side of the business, I had some contacts to draw upon. And these private clubs, synonymous to Studio 54 in the 70s, cocaine era. If Barry Gibbs is going to party at Honey for the Bears or any other given clubs in Miami, then he comes home listening to the music that those DJs played. Shortly after, he drives to the studio, drives to Criteria on the uh, Julia Tuttle Causeway as he hears the thump, thump, thump of driving. This is what ultimately leads to the single Jive Talk. 1974, one of the biggest disco singles of the era. At the end of 1977, RSO, Robert Stigwood, bought an article by Nick Cohn about the disco scene in Brooklyn, New York, and decided to make it into a movie. He asked the Bee Gees if they would be willing to contribute to the soundtrack, and they did by giving Nick their album that they were working on in Miami. That movie and that album turned out to be the smash hit Saturday Night Fever. So Atlantic became in charge of the Bee Gees in the USA, and Henry Stone is looking over here saying, this is interesting. One of his warehouse workers was a guy by the name of H. Wayne Casey. When he met Steve Alemo's mechanic, Rick Finch, at TK's as bottom dwellers, and they were given a green light to experiment in studio after hours, they developed a song. So they hired the Ocean Liners, a great funk band. They congealed into KC and the Sunshine Band. It goes without saying that KC and the Sunshine Band was one of the pinnacle bands of the disco era. In 1979, Henry Stone put out a song called Ring My Bell by Anita Ward, a disco song. From the words of Henry Stone, this was the fastest song to race to number one in his entire career. 60 Minutes reported disco was dead. How and why would, would anyone say disco is dead when the fastest song of his career to shoot number one? That doesn't make any sense. In Miami, they like to think it's a conspiracy. How do you compete with a label over here who throws out one single to the market, a 12-inch? Which is a brand new invention. What do you do? For the majors, they were grooming artists for five albums. The independents didn't do that. Now, let's flip forward to contemporary times. I think what's most notable in Miami's landscape for those of us who have been alive for the last 30 to 40 years. In 1979, as Cocaine Cowboys perfectly spelled out, the Cocaine Wars really went public with the Dade Land Mall Massacre. Once that happened, everything was on the center stage. Front stage as far as where the money was coming from, economically, and all businesses. It's a trickle-down effect. So even if you kept your nose clean, 
you may have had involvement in some way. And this was, of course, right before the Mario Boat Lift. The Mario Boat Lift changed the landscape racially of Miami more than anything. And for any fan of Scarface, you've seen a great dramatization. Something that's a reality. Scarface was filmed in 1983, three years after the boat lift, four years after the Dade Land Massacre. Now, here's the funny thing about it. Miami Vice is a TV show that popularized Miami. The landscape, the glamour, if you want to say there is glamour in that business, that didn't go on the air until late 1985. And of course, 1986 completely ended uh, the major trafficking in the most direct way and now it has to become an indirect industry, which so much happens with music. Let's go back a couple of years to South Florida and its music scene. In the 80s, Latin Invasion, the Cuban group Miami Sound Machine, fronted by Gloria Estefan, brought their crossover Latin American sound that was born in Miami, which really brought the world ears closer to South Florida. While pop culture and music were dominating the airwaves, the street was creating its own movement with the electro-funk sound. By 1984, electro music had already made its way to Miami through Africa Bambada's Planet Rock, and then it came other imitators. You know, you had uh, Planet Patrol play at your own risk. You had Quadrant Six with Body Mechanic, uh, Pretty Tony with Freestyle and all that. You had all this whole electro genre that was created out of hip hop music, hip hop culture in the early days before we even called it hip hop. Knowledge is power, right? Then we'll get here. This is, now I'm gonna get into some electro funk type shit that was big in LA. This dish right here is by a group called Sexual Harassment. This record right here was a big influence on the whole, on, on West Coast, you know, um, hip hop, period, toward the France. Um, artists like Egyptian Lover, you know, this right had everybody breathing heavy on their records, trying to make beats like, you know, um, metal on metal. Even legendary entertainers, such as Ice-T, were laying down their own electro-funk flows, such as songs like Reckless, that appeared in the movie Breakin'. Also, legendary hip-hop mogul Dr. Dre started his career with West Coast electro-funk with his group, The Wrecking Crew, with such songs as Surgery. And before Dr. Dre converted his styles of music to gangsta, there was Rodney O and Joe Cooley's big bass record on the slower tempo called Everlasting Bass. Planet Rock comes from a German band. You know, so you could say there's these German guys pretty much influenced hip hop because from Planet Rock starts the whole Miami Bay scene, starts the whole West Coast, sh like um, Egyptian Lover and all that. It all comes from Planet Rock, man, which comes from craft work. And spreading overseas to the groups like Gary Newman, Human League, many of those groups over there, and to the mighty craft work and them from Germany. Okay, well, we wouldn't even want to get started on that. And into Japan, Yellow Magic Orchestra. Oh my God. The drum machines were an outlet. Drum machines were a fluke. You have to have a demand for a product. And, and the demand really comes from, let's face it, craft work. Craft work, craft work. We can't say craft work enough. Although some people may say it too much without saying Georgia Marauder. Georgia Marauder and craft work uh, conjoined developed this, this language that we have. But ultimately, when craft work did Trans Europe Express, that became a staple of Grandmaster Flash's set. Therefore, a hip-hop standard for breaks in 1977. But if we flash forward, no pun intended, to the drum machine era, Kraftwerk released Computer World. Some people would say their swan song, their magus opus. It's just, this is the album that ushered in Electro. That's my man throwing down. My name is Scratch D from the act Dynamics 2. It all began back in the early 80s for me, working in a skating rink. I learned how to DJ there, and that was the, sort of the birth of that kind of music, the style of music that we branched off into and expanded on, which was electro. Electro music, when we were growing up, we heard in Kraftwerk, we heard Yellow Magic Orchestra, acts like that, ELO, and that was just a, an inspiration to me. As far as the, the vocorder, the vocorder idea pretty much came from Kraftwerk because at that time, Kraftwerk, you know, 
they would jam. They had like numbers and different things like that, tracks. Yeah, I love electro music. You know, back in the day when I was a little kid, my father, he used to go to London every year, so he brought back this Kraftwerk album called Autobond, and I was blown away by it. So when I heard that album, I wanted to, you know, make that type of music, like electronic music. So I go through all my records, and I'm digging for something. I find this Kraftwerk, because I'm a big fan of, of their records, like everything Kraftwerk did. I'm like a huge fan. So I find one of their tracks and I hear and I was like, this is awesome. So I put this in strategic little spots throughout the track, but I knew it was empty and I knew I needed some more stuff. So I'm constantly digging through all of my old records and I pull out some James Brown, that night train joint. And I sampled that in there and I started thinking, wow, Kraftwerk, James Brown, totally different worlds. Nobody's gonna really be feeling it. Uh, no, I shouldn't add it. But as I got away from it, I kept hearing it. And I was like, man, I don't know how to produce. To be honest, I don't know what the I'm doing. But all I know is that shit feel good. Rappers are always searching for new sounds to scratch into their recordings. It might surprise you to know that that sound is different in each region of the country. Public Enemy, a New York rap group, sold 750,000 copies of their first single in just six weeks. That, even though radio stations refused to play their radical political message. Definitely started out as a scratch DJ, learning from guys in New York. When I was in the military, I was stationed overseas in London, England. And guys from Rocksteady Crew, Africa Islam, different people like that used to come to London to do exhibitions. And by me being in the military over there, I was hearing about hip hop and this and that. This is, we're talking like 1982. Beatbox and Revelation were two records that I produced with some other guys that um, should remain nameless. But at the same time, they were my first ventures of going into the recording studio. But a lot of times, you know, Back in those days, the only reference you had was Run DMC at the time, and then you had Def Jam that was just coming out like in 84, 85. When I went to see Rick Rubin at his dorm room at NYU, he had a drum machine. The drum machine was called a Roland 808. That's the drum machine used to program the beat for It's Yours. We recorded It's Yours in a studio named Power Play. I sat in on the mix. Now here's the thing, when It's Yours was being mixed, I was, I'm a big fan of bass, of the bass sound. And I remember I kept telling the engineer to put more bass on the record. Now in the, in the studio you have big speakers and you have what's called monitors. I was not satisfied until those small monitors were ringing from the bass which led to It's Yours being the first, the very first huge bass record. And they had the little Crush Groove movie with LL and all these other people. So you were trying to emulate somewhat of the sound that they were coming with or what they were doing. So we tried to do our spin on the combination of using New York style scratching. This is the world famous Tretch DJ, Mr. Mix. Google me if you don't know who it is or where I come from, but I am a legendary pioneer of the Miami bass sound. Matter of fact, I'm one of the architects. We're gonna do something like this here. Give you an understanding of who I is. Can I say, if some of you old timers felt courageous enough to listen to rap songs, you might hear parts of some of your favorite groups mixed in. Along with some of the up-tempo stuff that Egyptian Lover and there's a guy named Pretty Tony um, from out of Miami. He had a lot of 
big freestyle records when I hear music and um, uh, some songs he did with Trenere and a couple other things. They were really big in California at the time. I've actually brought David Hobbs and and Chris Wong Wong, yeah. Fresh Kid Ice, yeah. from California. Yeah. Yeah. And they had that record and went through all that. A record promoter in uh, Florida, in Miami, I should say, he got a hold of our record and uh, gave it to a guy that I became good friends with, a guy named Luther Campbell. A lot of people know him as Luke Skywalker. So uh, he really liked the record and he felt like, you know, at the time he was a concert promoter, he figured that if he got the record hot, he could bring me and my other two compadres down to do some shows. But at the end of the day, Nick Salerno played Connect the Dots to get me here to Miami, Florida from uh, California. Then obviously I was fortunate to go through the whole Bambana thing, which is in a documentary, you know what I mean? He's a good friend of both of ours. No, 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 we gotta knock it down. Big baby love. Brother Africa, Bambaka, Universal Zulu Nation, the Amara, Universal Hip Hop Coach Us. And I met you in 1980. We worked from a payphone, and there was no such thing as CDs. We worked from vinyl, and did we play 45s? There was none of this anything, you know what I mean? We never we had a cassette, and the drum machine was just invented. That's right. We were in a studio, you, nobody in this room will even believe it. You know, with John Roby, they won't even believe the people. You know what I mean? But, you know, Arthur Baker, who I went to high school with. Tom, you follow me? They don't even know about Jelly Bean dating Madonna in the studio. Jelly Bean Benitez, that's right. There, there you go. We broke the record here, and it got so hot. Remember Jerry Russian, right? He played it three times on the turntable. Yes, sir. And it was so funky. And it definitely, definitely caused uh, many frequencies and vibrations to everybody around the planet, brother. But all of it is electro funk. Miami bass, the Rio funk, the Florida breaks, the Bali funk. The, uh, what else they got? The, the electronica, all the different styles. All part of the electric funk style. Great one down here who, who really took it out there and with yourself, you know, the mighty, mighty loop. He might have did it on the nasty tip, but he took it out there. And, and there we go. That's we, as they want to be, two life proof. Pretty total. Master. You know what I mean? Trying to use a statement in the year of our Lord, 1982. You know, we fought like warrior poets. Yep. You hear that beat, man? It's that old school shit, man. It's that old school. Came up on that. Oh my God, man. Well, anyway, here we are, finally. Mm -hmm. You know, after everything that we've been talking about, we're here at Pretty Tony Studio. So I just think he's arrived. You know, Nick just texted me. So, what's up, man? Let's do it, man. <laughs> How did the radios accept the style of music that you were pushing at the time? Well, um, I had just left being a DJ, so I kind of had a feeling for what they were playing and what they were liking. Yeah, during that time, it was like Beat Street, a lot of break dancing and, and, and uh, that type of music. I did what they were doing in the clubs already. You know what I mean? So I didn't, I didn't have to try to get them accustomed to liking something new. So what I did was just an extended uh, version of what was out there already. So they, they were very accepting to that. I know back then it started uh, in New York, the electro sound, and then it primarily kind of came down here and maybe California was doing a little bit with the Egyptian lover and all that stuff. I just wanted to know maybe some of your memories and thoughts on how, how it evolved from those points. The first group I did was an actual band. Drummer, guitar player, this and that. So we put the record out, the record went number one on the radio, and they went totally crazy. Everybody started telling them they were superstars and this and that and this and that. So they came to have me and say, we want to um, get rid of Tony because uh, he's trying to tell us too much what to do. So I go, I tell you what, you guys can do what you want to do. You can do everything you want to do. Get out of here. I went and bought an 808 drum machine, a keyboard, and a vocoder. And every record after that was platinum. When I did my first record, it went platinum. And to be quite honest, the people in New York thought I was lucky. So if you wasn't from New York back then, it wasn't, you know, it didn't, it wasn't considered legitimate. Play at your own risk, uh, fix it in the mix, you know, all these songs that were coming out, you know, Body Mechanic and all that. But to me, most of those songs were more like 
like for all the poppers, like all the dudes that were into the robotic style of dancing, not the b-boy stuff, because people used to confuse them both. When this track came out with Dance to the Drummer's Beat on, I was like, okay, now they're using breaks in these in these electro songs, you know? Because I was into the collecting all the break records back then and the ultimate break beat record collections and stuff like that we had. And um, we were dancing to that. And I remember somebody telling me, yo, man, you guys are still... You guys are still break dancing, man. That shit is played out, man. That shit is you gotta get with this new shit, man, and all that. I'm like, I'm like saying, look, man, you can keep throwing all the dick shit. Cause that was the name of the song, throw the dick. Right. You know what we call it throw the D. Yeah. You can keep throwing the dick, and while you throw in the dick, we're just gonna keep freaking breaking it down and doing our shit. You know what I'm saying? Well, here's another step in this film, man. Stevie, thanks for having us here today. We needed this thing, man, big time. It's like a dynamic of what we're doing, man. Even though breakdancing really never touched with bass music, but a lot of people came from the breakdance era. We're in South Florida, got into it. It was a natural progression, you know, Miami bass. It was electro, you know, and the whole planet rocked. Basically the foundation of the whole Miami bass music. We're downtown Miami at the B-Boy Pro-Am. It's going down, hip hop culture being represented to the fullest. Miami bass, you name it, we're doing it here today. It all started from breakdancing, coming from New York. Coming down here, digging the fast beats. When the break dancing thing was was uh, phasing out, I was going to the the Palace skating rink, and uh, I was watching this guy DJ Red. He had two copies of It's Time, and he was backing it up. And in the five minutes I was watching him, I saw that the fader moved over this way. That was turntable. The fader moved over that way. That turntable. When he was scratching. I knew the fader was the thing. So I went home, started practicing on my dad's stereo, ripping up records. So uh, by the time I actually got on some Technic 1200s, I was pretty good. I kind of compare it to like the Karate Kid with the wax on, wax off stuff. I was I was in a breakdancing crew called Atomic Rock, and we were breakdancing at this place called Trail Skateway in Palm Beach. And this DJ uh, named Scratch D, David Noller, uh, was out there. He was the DJ, and he actually DJed for our crew. We were pretty good at the time, and I was so fascinated by what he was doing. And he showed me about his mixtapes and, and his editing and all that. It was just, it was awesome. So from that point on, I, I had this itch to be a DJ, you know? To be the guy that was scratching and cutting. The scratching and, and the, the dropping of samples in there was not a, um, not a big thing to me because the last, you know, 10, 15 years, I had all this experience working in a skating rink and I knew the hits, and I knew what the kids wanted to hear and were familiar with sound, you know, the little sounds and snippets of, that would spark interest. In 84, you had Pretty Tony out, and uh, you had the whole Miami evolution of the music, like how Miami was creating its own sound out of that sound, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the thing was, when I'd seen the actual machine in London, and I'm tinkering around with the knobs and things like that, there's a knob, there's a kick drum knob on the 808 drum machine to where it'll either make a tight kick sound or it'll make the boom sound that everybody knows as the 808 boom sound now. But when the records, the Planet Rock record was made, Perfect Beat, all of these other records, that element wasn't used. And I always wondered why they would never turn the bass to where it would rumble and they just wanted to keep it tight. So. I always wanted to use that element, you know, in records from before. So when I did my first two records, I made sure that element was in it. Okay, so now let's get into the bass stuff. <laughs> Apparently, we're leaving this era called electro funk, and this 808 drum machine is being used more and more often now. There's a lot of people who claim invented bass. Do you have an idea or where it comes from? Or? Well, I will never claim to have invented it, okay. but I think I was one of the first ever to put out a record with bass in the title. You know, I used to go to like Liberty City or Overtown, and on the weekends there'd be these sound system crews out there. Space funk DJs, ghetto style DJs, all of them had names and they had crews and they had sound systems with these huge bass bins. And they would go out and be on the corner of some intersection in Liberty City or Overtown and on a hot summer day or a weekend they would have these impromptu street parties and a lot of them played uh, electro records from New York 
and they would use the instrumental portion of the records and rap live over it. And people would go crazy. The people that heard this stuff going on live would go to the record stores and they couldn't buy it there, you know, because it was it was done impromptu right on the spot. And so somebody got the bright idea of taking one of these electro tracks and rapping on top of it or maybe scratching a little like they did live at the shows also uh, on the street corners. And all of a sudden you had this this uh, kind of organic growth of a different type of style that was created live on the spot that they went into the studio and recreated. Uh, eventually, I started putting out these records, and I put out a record called The Bass That Ate Miami that incorporated a lot of these things into it, the scratching, the, and also the, the use of samples dropping in and things like that, and it caught on. And also, the name bass music caught on because of the enormous bass bins that the DJ crews used to use and it was recreated in the studio by cranking up the, uh, the the bass when you made these records. Ghetto style DJs, Baby Set, Marvelous JP, Amazing Chico, Luke Skywalker, these were great DJs who, who, who threw great parties, uh, party down DJs, Space Funk, uh, maybe most notably CM Express, Chris and Mark, FL DJs who were, who were there in 1979. Jam Pony Express in 1980. I'm Captain D from the FL DJs, Def Rock Crew, and Def Bass Crew. Started back in 1979. Um, just got into it in high school, hanging out. Started DJing at the skating rinks. Uh, met up with uh, Slick Vic, and uh, I built up the FL DJs, started doing parties. Around 1980, the skating rink closed down. They split up, I kept FL DJs and um, wound up still jamming. I went to Northeast High School, met with this cat that was in my class named uh, Jeff Austin, which I found out later on is DJ Slick Vic's brother, who took me over to DJ Slick Vic's house, met Vic, everything clicked, and FL DJs, we were like the white crew, and uh, the Sam Pony, of course, the Jam Pony. Hey, hey, the sounds that you are now listening to and being possessed by the one and only Jam Pony, Pony Express yes. DJs featuring yours truly, DJ Slick Vic Pony. in the music with Mac Nasty Slime Grove's ear. Er, lock cool job. You know the business, ain't it? Yeah. Panty Raider, Zeke the Freak. Check out What the up? What's up with y'all? Right, if you're not up? wearing panties, I'm talking to all of the yeah. freaks. Lead at yes, yeah. man. Uh, Jam Pony was out way before I was making records, just making mixtapes. And they were probably the first dudes to ever do mixtapes. I know everyone says they got the mixtape now. These dudes, these were the original mixtape guys, the Jam Pony Express guys. I touched upon a second ago. You know, I think Jam Pony had a lot to do with it. You know, the fast-paced DJing and talking over records, and as they're being mixed. Jam Pony. It was like, it was just, every Saturday it was like crazy, man. It was just like, you know, I couldn't, it just was, I can't even describe it, man. Like, Slick Vic was just crazy. He was so good, man. He was like one of my favorite, too. Uh, you feel me? They had that boom in it, though. Yeah. They had that bass in it. It, it, it got play in my ride. Yeah. As long as they had that bass. And we loved that. That's why we loved the, the early uh, Run DMC records. And, uh, Big shots out the Slack Pack. Uh, uh, Gucci Crew. The Gucci Crew, the Puppies. Uh, you feel me? All of them, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And our Gucci. Young and the Restless. Young and the Restless. Oh, God. That Gucci Crew, boy. Gucci Crew. Oh, man. I love it. That, man. Yeah. Luke, Luke, everybody, man. Yeah. yeah. Now, let's meet some of the bass artists, producers, and executives and listen to their stories and memories as they relive the creation of bass music. Well, basically, myself, you know, I wasn't never meant to be a rapper. I was an athlete, you know. I figured that I would have been playing pro football or basketball or something, but that didn't work out, so I happened to be in the right place at the right time. And that's how I became the parents of Roxanne. <laughs> Hanging out at Royal Sounds at the Lotta Hill Mall, Foresight Records, because it was a record shop and a record label. We used to hang out in the back, listening to new records, scratching, had a turntable and mixer set up in there. And then uh, I found out Gigolo Tony needed a, a DJ to go on the road. So he used to come in and out of the office. I was in there scratching. It was kind of like, you know, oh, that guy sounds good. And we connected from that point. Yeah, let's check it out. It's fly, you know, it's called 
Dance with the Boogie. Dance with the Boogie. This is a gigolo tone, and I guess I'm the man, so let's do it. <laughs> let's talk about Parkway Records. That was all yours? Well, that was uh, uh, myself and uh, Tyrus Neal, uh, who owns uh, Cafe 51 Club up on Brow. What's up, T? We went in that together and started Parkway Records. And the first song actually was co-produced Devin. Captain D, you know, we flip flop. I produced him, now he produced me. <laughs> so that was the first record, uh, Dance with the Boogie, which he produced uh, with our Parkway record. So that was your first video that got aired on BET's Rap City. Yeah, that, that's the video, the first one. The first video ever by Gigolo Tony, you know, came off a of Parkway record, independent record label. Where I come from, the sound is a little slower. Yeah, well, it's more of a dance market here. You know, it's like, that's all I want to do is party, dance, you know? And bass sounds a lot better going faster. Now, the, the, the bass thing, what that was about, when we went in the studio, we always pushed more and more to get, you know, higher levels, stronger levels uh, on the bass uh, side of things. You know, because the main thing about it, because of the bass, we wanted everything to be big. You know what I'm saying? That's why we had the big horns, you know, we, we had, you know, we rented the emulators to come in because we wanted everything big and strong and, you know, full body, like, you know, the bass, because, you know, we wanted to make, you know, big productions. Everybody was saying that this bass thing wasn't going to last, that it was a fad, just like they said hip hop was a fad when it came in. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people tried to stop that Miami movement because it just came out of nowhere and when it took over, it took over in a massive way. The clubs, the streets, it just took them by storm. The cars. Oh, forget about it. Anybody who had boom in their car wanted a Miami bass record. Bass music also started the booming audio system craze, which nowadays is still relevant in the car shows. As we were filming this car show here at OffLeaseOnly.com, a mega car dealership in Miami, custom cars and trucks filled a lot like they did back in the 80s, which goes to show you how bass music inspired all of these booming car audio followers that are still passionate about continuing the lifestyle today. Each ride is custom with pimped out paint, sick rims, and a booming system just like the dance. These cars required you to drop them low to the ground, and even some of them bounced with their hydraulic systems. While the radio stations and clubs were playing bass, there was another bass genre on the rise at the car audio shows. Let's give credit to some of the originators that created this sound. Dynamix 2, Magic Mike, Tech Master PEB, Neil Case, Bass Mechanic, Derek Roming, Power Supply, Billy E, Debonair, Megatron, and Bass Cube, just to name a few. Dynamix 2, along with me, we came to defeat. The one to be perpetrated is gonna be tasting the purple beast. What does this represent? Deep, deep, and brutal, like the color itself is bruised up and suitable. Profiling, low riding, who's driving? You, they keep your eye on the road, passengers mind in your stereo system. Nissans are kicking, monsters are hissing, S10s are wishing to bump and thump the deep, complete feet. Yo, I'd rather do all this in my Jeep. To the front, give a chance to get back at the ladies. And for me, like I said, a native New Yorker, hearing that for the first time, man, I was so open. First time I went on 61st Street and, and 15th Ave, and I heard my man, Uncle Al, God bless the dead, play that Sugar Hill sound with that fucking wall of speakers. And I'm like, God damn, this shit is serious. I love it. I love it. So I went in. Every time I went in the studio, I went hard. It was fun, but it was serious fun. You know what I'm saying? It was serious for me. Real shit. <laughs> Wouldn't you just know it? The Miami rap sound is called Bass Jam. Heavy on the beat, played at a level obviously designed to liquefy the brains of those over the age of 30. Rap is so big in Miami, that's all Joey Boy is making this year. And they sell records, lots of records, even without advertising. There were a lot of independent labels, and they would come out with uh, music like if it was no tomorrow. Every week, it was three or four singles or an album. The records were doing so well from the first one that um, we had the pressing plants down here running two shifts. So we had four pressing plants on double shifts. 
So <laughs> went out and bought a pressing plant and made it 24 seven. So that was the only way we was able to keep our records. When I did the first one, uh, uh, fixed it in the mix. Then one pressing plant was doing that one, then jammed the box, another pressing plant, only my records. And then when I hear music wow. came, you know, so that's, that's how it went. You know? The major labels, they've got a big budget, relatively speaking, to get that done. And then here is some little one-off or two-off street label, or even a label, let's say, like Pandas or Joey Boy or Foresight, and they're just blowing the majors out of the water. And would you say that that reflects what TK was doing in the 70s? Yeah, absolutely. You know? This is my man James right here, DXJ, Magatron, the originator, one of the originators of the Miami Bay sound uh, from back in the early 80s. James, why don't you tell him a little something about Is that the Godfather? <laughs> the Quadfather. The Quadfather. Well, what made you get, like, uh, what was the, the thing that made you get into the whole electro side and the... Because I could see that that's what it was. That's where it was going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um... And the people that I was working with, like we were just talking about, all roads lead back to Henry Stone. Mm -hmm. I'm working with people that came from that. These are like the disco era. Excellent. You know, I had been in the studio with Willie Clark, Clarence, Freddie Stonewall. You know, not not doing it, just just sitting there, just a fly in the wall in the background. Cool. You know, at Henry's old place. And so you said you saw that that's where it was going. Was it like the whole like was it the break dancing that you saw like the kids it was doing? that it was, was that? everything. It was that like I could see that you could do this stuff and cut through all the layers but not to put musicians out of business or not not to put them to the side because I dealt with people that were drummers ah drum machines it's like you should take the drum machine because you would do things with this drum machine that I wouldn't even have an idea of what to do so I just took it upon myself and I just stripped everything down and went into doing electronic music if you want to put it that way which is what Miami street music was. Absolutely. Now, when you came into play, was it the DXJ? Actually, yeah. We we were introduced by um, somebody else that we were working with at the time. I had picked up on uh, like films like, like Beat Street and whatnot, so I, I was kind of sucked in by that. So I, I wanted to be that guy, that, that musician guy that plays those records for the crowds and gets the people moving, gets the people dancing. So I was, practicing and playing with my you know in the bedroom and kind of getting my craft together and i guess he recognized i guess whatever skills i had at the time so he invited me to a studio session which was taking place and uh with that i said hey this is great golden opportunity and you know thank you appreciate it i walked in with the turntables with the stack of records and i said what do we do here's the beat here's the basic melody this is you know verse course whatever you know bam the rest is improvised at the studio right exactly and i, I felt that i knew it. that and I kind of just jumped into it. So, okay, great. So I'm pulling out records one by one, scratch here, put, put this together, scratch this, scratch that. And the next thing you know, it's like we have like patterns going on in, in, in the way like the cuts and the scratches were laid out in this record. But it was unique to the way that we were just saying like sentences and we were saying things that made sense, you know? With the success of Def Jam and Rick Rubin's experimentation with drum machines um, across the board, but certainly including 808 and sustained 808 kick drums, uh, within South Florida we have our own, which was Amos Larkins. How I got the bass was a total accident, all right? It was a mistake on my behalf. It was something that I just didn't check out. And what happened was I was really heavy on coke and I used to visit like a lot of strip joints and stuff like that. So this is what I remember. I remember leaving the knock because I thought that's interesting. And I just was I was sitting there contemplating because sometimes when I'm doing music I think about it a lot, you know. And then I and I went, oh shit, wait a minute, this girl, it was like my favorite fucking stripper was there. She was waiting on me and she finally fucking after like maybe about twenty thousand dollars, she finally agreed to come come with me. <laughs> and as she was dancing and she was playing around shit, I hit the button and the shit just recorded and I didn't listen to it and I let it go just like that the next day. And then the, the time I heard it is because I went with Disco Joe to drop it off to the distributors, right? Fuck, man, I heard this shit in the store. It was right on Northside, bro. I remember eating that fucked up bass. I said, oh, my heart was like, <laughs> I fucked. My ass, matter of fact, I was all coked up the night before. My nose got clear. I could smell. <laughs> Breathe like clear. See, I was so nervous. <laughs> Anyway, I said, so then the people was like, what the fuck is that? They started lining up for the shit, man. I was I was driving some guys and they was playing this record called Ghetto Jump, right? Shit was tearing up the speakers, right? I said, wait a minute, stop, stop. They go, what? I said, do you really like that? 
<laughs> man, that shit's the shit, man. <laughs> well, fuck it. Let's do it some more. So I just, I just kept doing it. I just kept doing it, and and it became my new base. That's what happened. Number one rated MC, amazing B, intellectually down with my force in ITC, cause we're all from Miami. Meet the Miami Boys, two young men from Coconut Grove who've just cut their first rap record on the Joey Boy record label. My new better than a bad cat, nothing can be gone. She gets no slack cause she's fetching mama ways the time. A lot of the cultures are coming together around rap because it's just, I mean, there's so many things you can do with, you can do with rap music. Think in the future to be more popular than rock. At least one applied behavioral scientist thinks we're missing the boat with the popularity of rap. He calls it a creative outlet that can reach children. I think people have a hard time accepting it because of where it originated from. But as more people get into it, I mean, you've got white rappers. So, you know, I'm in 11th grade. I got a nice little record out. It's doing all right. You know, I'm trying to get my little shine on. It's doing okay. You know, but um, I'm not satisfied with that. So I went through a period of my time where I wasn't happy with the record label. I was like, ah, oh, you know, they, they didn't really not doing nothing. They weren't talking about another second single. And um, at that point, I was like, it, you know, it might be time to move on. And we had a little controversy between me and Cooley. I know Cooley didn't want me to leave Beware Records because, you know, that was, you know, he was basically helping Beware run that thing. But I was like, you know, it's time for me to, you know, move on. And I went through a c couple other DJs. Um, I really have a DJ at this time, and I had a, a partner of mine that had a huge record collection. Matter of fact, he's probably got one of the best old school record collections in South Florida, and his name is Fat Pat. If you never said I ain't never give you no props, I can give you all your props right now, bitch. Fat Pat, you the man. I said, Pat, you know, I need a DJ. He said, man, I got a DJ for you. I said, who? He said, trust me. He took me over there and he took me to this dude named uh, Juan's house. Well, Juan's better known as uh, DJ Wiz. And um, Wiz had a nice little setup at the house. He had his 1,200 turntables drum machine doing his thing and uh, we just hit it off you know we became you know friends ever since then we just you know we started the group started Andy and DJ Wiz made our first record boom I got your girlfriend and um, from there the thing just kind of took off you know still on the independent label side until Atlantic picked us up um, but that's a whole nother story however David Noller his trip down the base station turned into something entirely different, nobody could have been prepared for. Uh, by taking Lon Alonzo, better known as Ace in the Place, to drive down with them, the two sat down with Eric Griffin behind a board known as the Dynamix, and with the SP-12, Emu's SP-12 that was mostly unused in hip hop. The 808 was the gear that made the bass. Eric Griffin was sampling the 808 into the SP-12, and they took it multi-tonal, and it has a rapid fire machine gun sound. And originally Eric Griffin had this track called George of the Jungle. Basically just a dong, 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 da dong. And, you know, he just, from the old TV tunes records, he'd scratch in George, George, George of the Jungle. And uh, that was gonna be the name of the track. And uh, basically we talked him into doing more of an up-tempo track because we wanted to, you know, David and I were into, into the whole DJ thing, so we, we brought a bunch of records and said, you know, we'd rather do something more like the Planet Rock style because we like the up-tempo shit. And, uh, you know, Eric Griffin was the one that was kind of tuning the bass kind of before anybody else did. And I think George of the Jungle was, was kind of the reason, if you think about it, why those it made sense to kind of tune the bass um, into the bass music. They pretty much came up with uh, Give the DJ a Break, and then Dave and I pretty much just added the scratches to it. The beat was put together. Uh, we went back and forth with it and arranged it with him. And then we went to the studio to record it and put the drops in and give the DJ a break was born. With all these people combined, they made this fantastic monument of our genre known as Just Give the DJ a Break. And with Candyman's money and the push of uh, Base Station as a club and as a label, they changed the genre and caused everyone to run out and, and find out what machine made this sound. The 808 was suddenly becoming antiquated. The SB12 was a phantom machine that everyone had to get their hands on. So this is the SB1200. A lot of the best bass music was made on it. It's been a while since I messed with one, but uh, it's like riding a bike, you don't forget. So we're gonna start, make a simple beat right now. 129 beats per minute. Uh, get a little metronome going here. Start off with I hat, simple.
care who you are, whenever you had an SP-1200, you know this is the first thing you did when you had the bass. Here, what you're looking at is the classic, original TR-808, 1980 edition, original first. And uh, over here is the Roland TR-909, which was issued shortly after the um, the 808, which is, uh, I'm gonna guess it was 82. And the turntable plays a lot to do with that. The turntable samples everything on the planet, <laughs> including the stuff we're not allowed to sample. And the new piece right here? But don't tell anybody. Is? Uh, this is the new school uh, sampler, sequencer, the hardware tool. A lot of kids nowadays like to use software, but you can't get me on software if you pay me. So yeah, this is this is it. To me, I have to, I gotta beat on pads, I gotta, I gotta twist knobs and, and get all in it like this. That's how I get that. Okay. What's that? Hear that? There you go, so It's bad that a television set, you know, won't capture the thump of rap. So through uh, Marty Michael and Beware, uh, there's a person you linked up with in the early phases that yeah. uh, you did some records with. You want to speak on that? He spins it a different way, but the way I spin it is without Cooley C, there's no KJ. And without KJ, there's no Cooley C. That was what you call a business deal gone right. First of all, Cooley, I would just, my Cooley C, I would just like to say thank you very much for being here today. Obviously, born Baltimore, Maryland, Luke Skywalker. How'd that come about? What happened? Back in 86. I met Luke through this guy named Beware, uh, Beware Records. Um, and him and this guy named Mighty Michael, they gave me a chance to perform for Luke. If we rock the club Pac Jam, Luke would sign me. Pac Jam is like the Apollo of Miami. And I dropped it. And since then, I recorded with Luke to live, what's 86, 87, 88. Their first record was Throw the Dick. Mm -hmm. And then the second record was my record, uh, Cheryl and Donna. Mm -hmm. um, and we made that record because me and brother Marquise had a girl and we would just, whatever the song says, that's what happened. And this guy named Big Man. <laughs> and Big Man, she, the girl wouldn't give me no pussy. So Big Man slam dunk the girl in the toilet bowl. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the song, that's yes. the lyric. The Sherilyn Dunn. Sherilyn Dunn. 1986? Yes, 86. Around there? I mean, we left uh, Luke, and then we got with Beware, and uh, let's get this party started, rolls out. You know, and it, and it, and it booms. I want to hear more about like the actual production of, uh, of Let's Get This Party Started, because I know... Uh, Let, let's Get This Party Started was, was produced the idea and everything came from me. I, I guess the point I'm trying to get to is I was I was the beat and Cooley was the brains. Mm -hmm. Let's get this party started. When does that come out and how does that come about? Okay. Um, he was well, doing the music and you were singing? Well, well I was doing the music. Mm -hmm. I was doing everything. Um, and KJ, he was just the DJ. Okay. 
That's what, that was the uh, real deal. But my thing was, yo man, I want KJ and Cooley C solidified and solid first. So then, Cooley starts working with David No, Dynamics too. I, I was like, you know, why are you in the studio with them doing shit and, and performing on their records and you know what I mean? So I bounced. That's how I ended up with Forsyth. So cool, we see you and beware. Bam, I'm out. Cut it. Cuties, we got Cause we hit his box. I did um, Cuties, we got him. With who? We cut it up Death Records. That was uh, a label that I started with a few of my friends that I'm sure you guys have met. Um, Bob Smith and uh, Mark Music introduced me to Bob. And uh, from there on, that was it, man. The label was born. That was the beginning of rap music for us in Palm Beach County on the Lake Worth side. This is uh, Brain Damage. The records I did back in the bass era started in the 80s. I did um, Get Retarded. It was uh, KJ and the Fellas. I wrote and uh, co-produced. Got no credit, <laughs> but that was back then. And I did, um, so give you, me that. You huh? had a different name. Yeah, that name was, I went on the Tuggy Rock back then. And I'm not getting a check. And I'm like, yo, I, I came to Cooley. I was like, yo, man, let's go to Foresight. And Cooley was like, no, I'm staying with Beware. I'm not switching anymore. So I was like, yo, I'm bouncing. So I, I end up down there. And Tuggy Rock, he uh, comes down to the studio with me. And I'm, you know, he's, he's, he's in the studio. It's me, Frank Cornelius, and Jig, and AD, and... I'm playing this Get Retarded track. And uh, I didn't have no lyrics to go with it. It's just a track. Mm -hmm. you know, bump, bump, bump. Yeah, who created those orchestra badges? I did all that. Yeah. Tuggy Rock came up with the, hey, you all, let's get retarded now that the party started. Okay. And I was like, that's it. And we, we did that record, man. We probably did that record in 20 minutes. I mean, after, he, after the hook, it was like 20 minutes. It, it, it was done. That's just the record took off. That was just his. I told him how I wanted the song to go, and he had the beat machine, so we worked it. And so when we got the song complete, it was badass. It was a hit. I went back to Palm Beach while he was in Lauderdale. So when the record was pressed, I went back down to look. It said KJ and the fellas. There was no Tuggy Rock on there. So I got pissed off, figured I'd stick with gangster rap. Went back. Um, to the drawing board. Brain damage was born. Brain damage was born. Next track I did, once I finished with get, um, get Retarded, I jumped on with Danny D and DJ Wiz. And we did, um... Boys from the Bottom. Boys from the Bottom. We did, what, Give Me That Thing. Give Me That Thing. Papa Smurf Can't Lick My Ass. Yeah, Lick My Ass, <laughs> bitch. Thank you. So we did that song. And, you know, and we did the Boys from the Bottom yeah. album. We did two albums. And I did my solo album, Brain Damage which was supposed to be a straight thug gangster album. And, um, but Hot Productions wasn't really having that at the time because all they wanted was bass. Boom, 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 That's boom. That's all anybody wanted back then was bass. Yeah, so. Real them, rappers, real rappers got no play. Real hip hop got no play on the radios or anywhere. Jam Pony gave real rap play, but as far as us doing real, real lyrical stuff, it yeah. wasn't getting no play. And I break them off something right now. It ain't your Amy, it's Miami. I'ma state it from the gate. It's your favorite Chico. Fading your favorites, custom made and dated. The best of the best, creme de la creme. It's the top of the line, exquisite design. It's that cat that make them donuts for your chick to nibble on. Drool and dribble on. Watch me while I get my swivel on. Chico Deluxe, I got that platinum lining. And when I'm rhyming, I'm worth your weight in diamonds. Now when I elaborate, it's so elaborate. Fuck the bullshit you fabricate. I'm Cabin stabbing it, I put it out there for the mommies to be grabbing it and we'll be walking the beach, you'll be crabbing it. Watch me now, cause I'ma split your shit. Don't make me spit your clip. Don't give a nigga nothing else. Don't give a nigga nothing else. Don't give him nothing else, dog. Take your ass out of the game. Don't give him nothing else. Don't give him nothing else. Calm down, dog. Calm down. Nah, see me now. And me and Brain Damage were trying to get signed to Beware Records. But what happened was one night I got a phone call and Brain Damage and Cooley were on the phone. Cooley asked me if I wanted to DJ for him and Brain Damage was going to go with Dynamics 2. And 
uh, I was like, hell yeah, you know. So that's how me and Cooley got together. And from that day forth, you know, we just started doing stuff. I had an idea to mix merengue with Miami Booty Shake. I said, ah, let me give it a whack. So I'm at home one day and I grabbed the Wilfredo Vaga album that had El Africano on it, which is Mami and Negro. I took the Clay D instrumental and I started mixing this record with it. And it actually went perfect. So I'm like, oh shit, this sounds good. So that, that, that night I had a mix show and I said, oh fuck it, I'm gonna try it. So I play the record, boom, and I scratch it, na, 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 and all of a sudden, bro, the phone lines lit up. People are like, yo, what's that record? It's like, it's not a record. I'm <laughs> basically just experimenting, having a good time. The original mashup. That's right, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and I got such an overwhelming response on the radio that day that I said, shit, this really should be like a record record. So I had met Danny D. So I played the Boom I Got Your Girlfriend record on the radio, and people went crazy for that. So I said, shit, oh, I should link up with Danny and DJ Wiz, my concept, let Danny, you know, write and do uh, and do the verses and everything, make the track, let's, let's go. So we got in the studio and we, we made this record. Everybody, the, every label that I went to told me, oh, it's a novelty, it's a nice novelty, but it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work, it's not gonna work. And finally, right here in my own backyard, I went to go see Bo Crane over at Pandas Music. I sat in his office, He's like, he hears the record, he's like, yeah. Yeah, I like it, it's different. Fuck it, let's do something. So, went to the studio, made the record with Danny. Record comes out, record explodes. And I remember sitting in the limo with Danny D. We had just done a show in San Francisco. And he said, dude, we made it. <laughs> he said it to me in the limo. And you know, at that time, you're like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're in a different state. You know, people are loving your music. Hell yeah, we made it. And the success of the single was so good that Bo Crane said, hey, lads, how about we do an album? Because that's, you know, that's where the money's at. All right, shit, yeah, why not? Let's go, let's, let's go do an album. So we sat in the studio and, you know, I got together with uh, everybody that, that I was fucking with at the time. Uh, Breezy B, uh, Everybody that I said, ah, fuck it, let, let, let's go do something. And then the album was born. And there was no title for the album, so it was just self-titled DJ Laz with the most horrendous picture of me ever. <laughs> you know, you look back now and you go, shit, the hell were we thinking? But the album took off. And all these different records started, started popping off. And it was, at that point, and at that time, nobody had done Spanish and English booty, so it was something different, it was innovative, it was something different. And that's when you know, it caught a lot of attention, and a lot of different people were like, yo, I'm gonna fuck with this guy, this, you know, it's, it's a completely different feel. And then the next album comes along, and the record just started getting better and better, and shit, the, the last album I dropped now was uh, about, Three, four years ago, maybe a little longer, uh, Category 6, which had Moose Shake Drop with Pit and Flow, and, and that record just out of here. Are you people ready for some more bass? The three major South Florida radio stations who were instrumental in the popularity of Miami bass were 99 Jams, Hot 105, and Power 96. And respect must be given to the late Bo Griffin and Don Cox. I actually came up with the name 2BMF while we were with Cheetah Records, right when we were leaving, because Tom said, look, this is what we gotta do. We, we wanna make you and Mike Jewish another group, so this way you don't have to work with Mike. And again, I don't know if Mike didn't wanna work with us or if Tom was making this up, I, I don't know, you know? So anyways, Tom said, he says, look, this is what I want you guys to do. I want you to be like, the, like a white version of True Life Crew. So I came up with a song called Let's Make Some Noise, and it was, you know, it was a dirty rap, and, and that, that's how I made that song. We started to record it, but we never finished it. Actually, I did a show in that same club, um, Futura, and um, we performed Make Some Noise off of a cassette tape, right off a of cassette tape, because that's what we had back then. Um, so after that show, I met uh, this guy named Ned, and um, he, 
asked if he could manage us. So we did. We signed a contract with him, and, and we, went, we went that route, and he managed us. So that's how... Um, so he was the one to actually release We Can Get Together, which we recorded in Hollywood Sync. Uh, this leads to your working with Lana Lanza. Yes. How did that come about? Somehow I met Jock, but I think it was, must have been a show we had together. You guys were in, tra in tra another transition with labels, and I was like, you know, we had the Cut It Up Death thing going on, and then you guys decided to roll with, with Lon with the Ace Records. Right, because you wanted you said you wanted to do you and I wanted to do a remix of, of We Could Get Together. Yes, exactly. And then um, we did um, Dog in You, and then I believe Jock had started a, a beat at one time. I don't believe we had the title at that time, but or it might have been Pushing the Bush. It might have been the title. And that's one of the first ones that I brought to him. Because Pushing the Bush was actually something I originally recorded as Vicious Beat a long time ago in Hideaway, actually. Dolly, who's AD? I'm your bass mechanic. Got with one of my partners and went to um, the Royal Sound of Music, which was in the Lauder Hill Mall. And that was owned by Billy Hines, which is MCADE's father. And we, we went in there to try and get a rap record deal. They weren't really looking for any rap groups at the time. They noticed, you know, that I was a DJ and the whole, I was like the, one of the first white dudes to be doing any type of turntableism or cuts or anything back then down here. So uh, Adrian, ADE, decided to jump on that. So at that point, I was really into the Miami bass, really getting into the music, and I decided to uh, branch out. So I said, you know, I'm getting tired of being in the back here. And uh, I broke out, did my own track, which was called It's Time to Rock the House, and uh, broke away from ADE. I had a lot of a lot of fun doing that stuff, but I had to do my own thing, do my own Just music. I mean, I was influenced by some of the Miami groups. Not too many of them, but some of them. Uh, Gucci Crew, uh, my homie Half Pint, you know what I mean? Poison Clan, Two Live Crew. I was influenced by that music, but they sound was Miami, and I wanted to keep my sound Palm Beach, you know what I mean? So I barely slid my way in. By the fact, Danny D from West Palm Beach, DJ Wiz from West Palm Beach, and we had that shit on lock, second to loop. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So, uh, learning from Dave Nola and Lauren, they taught me how to run the, the SB1200. And I'm my own influence, you know what I mean? I want to influence other people, to, which I did in the ATL, you know what I mean? It's like they took the style and they ran with it, you know what I'm saying? Being from Florida, because Atlanta is so inspired by the Miami base that um, when I came to Atlanta, they embraced me. They, it's like open arms. They took me in in that style. And then Lil John came about, and Yin Yang Twins came about. All that from that that, that kid money influencing. You know what I mean? That's that's where that came from. The boot the booty thing was a blessing. Again, I was just actually getting my feet wet. Um, had just really linked up with Clay, and um, you know he was telling me, "Yo, man, I got a session tonight." Um, he had already probably flew Mike in. You know, for the for the DJ and part of it, um, Half Pint was there, Bobby Ford Senior was there, uh, an abundance of women. <laughs> it was a beautiful night, um, and uh, you know, basically, I was just there morally supporting. You know, I, I was able to get on the record as as a person in the background. Um, Chazzy Chaz, salute to you, brother, wherever you are. I didn't understand bass music because I, I'm, I'm a New Yorker. So I had to learn to appreciate it. But it was the drive in the boom, the lows of that music that just grabbed me. And see them girls shaking their ass to it? Man, come on, it got no better than that. So, you know, along with, like I said, with the, boot, the booty thing, it was just a bunch of people in the, in the lab. They vibing out, Clay and them doing what they do. I'm watching Clay lay this track, like, in the lab. Lay the track. Mike going in on the scratches. And we just all boop the boop the boop boop there. You know what I'm saying? That record was all overseas, Japan. I remember going places with them that I've never been. Never thought I'd see in my life. Simply because that record took off the way it did. To me, it's hip hop. It all comes from hip hop. It all came from Africa Bambata, Planet Rock, Cool Herc, the parties, and uh, the, 
break dancing and just the vibe of that and it just spread throughout the world and California had their own thing with it and uh, you know Miami had its own thing so when I came down here I kind of brought my New York element you know just like the others just like Prince Raheem and Cooley was from Baltimore KJ was from New York we all came down here and we had that vibe up there we kind of brought that down here and mixed it up with what was going on down here with the disco the pretty Tony electro and all that stuff cut it up deaf so I was DJing and I was at this DJ battle. It was uh, this club that was pretty popular in West Palm Beach called The Fun House. Uh, but it was a teen club first and it was called RJ's and they were having a contest to see who was gonna be the resident DJ. So Jimbo backspun, it's time for like 15 minutes. I went on and I ended up winning. It was in Palm Beach and it was my hometown so I'm sure that had something to do with it. But uh, when I got off the stage, very angry young Puerto Rican man by the name of Johnny Torres uh, ran up to me, uh, very irate that I had won. Because he said that you were like, motherfucker, what's up, what's up, motherfucker, what's up, 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 what's
we had we stumbled across a couple of decent records that we thought were decent and they ended up being really good and turned into uh, some regional hit records you know cut it up death uh, there was one called Miami Skeezer that we did uh, Chris and I and, uh, party time and a bunch of records we just it was just every couple of months we dropped a 12 inch which was great before I decided to throw in the towel I got with uh, a good a close friend of mine named Calvin Puckett we call Cooley C and we opened up our own studio and started working the studio together and I kind of left slip and slide for a little while there or for a while and we opened up our own studio in Fort Lauderdale and that went really well we, we both you know, we made some great music together. and So I went from there, kind of back to Slip and Slide for a little while. I hooked up with this guy, Big D. He's a really nasty guitar player, producer. And I, I told him, look, get with me. Let's, let's write some real music. Let's try to do something. Pretty Ricky happened upon this record that me and Big D did called Gronomy. At the same time, around three weeks later, an artist named Pitbull cut to a track of mine and did a song called Damn It Man. He actually cut the record with Calvin and I in the studio. Uh, Calvin engineered that session. And we didn't know what he was gonna do with it. He released it and it blew up. So Agronomy blew up, that blew up. And Ted Lucas called me and said he had this, this idea. Uh, he wanted to put Trick over this one record that I had played for him a long time ago. And when I played it for him a long time ago, he told me it was too rock for Trick. It's too much, he, you know, he's a rap artist. but. Trick loved it, they decided to cut it. A uh, young man named Case One wrote the chorus to it. Little John cut it, Twister featured, let's go. So I had three top 10 records back to back. Pretty Ricky got signed. A lot of great things happened in that year, 2004. And then in 2005, you know, my life changed. I won Songwriter of the Year, Producer of the Year with BMI. And, and things just really started to, to happen then, you know? Also uh, releasing Miami Bass Jams Volume 2, and I thought a big part of that would be get Gemini involved to do the actual anthem of the relaunch of the label, to actually do the track Cut It Up Def Part 2. So that's what we're doing tonight, and uh, getting ready to get in the studio and drop some of these tracks. Hey man, I'm glad to be back, dude. You know what I'm saying? Glad yeah, to have you, you back. Don't, you don't forget shit, man. I guess there's nothing left to do, but just go up and do what we always do. One baby. T.O.P. Doc T's his name, Gemini's me. Pioneers of the game as a claim to fame. Too much bass, you know who's to blame. To you with DJs, you ain't ready for this. Focus, man, so you don't miss. The LSDJ on the cut today. Hey, yo, D. Cut it up, cut it up. Uh. Drop, 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 drop. This Q Dog from Splat Pack. Yo, what's happening? This your boy Uncle Head, Splat Pack. Uh huh. We've been doing this thing for a long time. Y'all, y'all wanna know something about us and what we did? Paul Beach County. All day, huh? Born, Born and raised. raised. Reveal the raw. Paul Beach County. You know what I'm saying? That's what that's what it is. Now see what we did. We did them songs. You know, shake that ass. Scrub the grind. Let me see you work it. Slow it. Smoke one. Tip for the strip. Uh, shall we go on? Pop it with y'all, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we did this thing with Kid Money. It was a splat pipe. The reason I came up with the splat pipe name is because where I'm from, it was like a lot of groups. Like you had Two Live Crew, you had Poison Clan, you had Gucci Crew. So I, I wanted a little crew. I ain't gonna lie, I thank Kid for putting me in the game, you know what I'm saying? And introducing me to the music scene, because he was already out. Oh, yeah. He, 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 he was doing that thing since he was in high school. Right. And, and it's crazy, because all of us had the same idea for Scrub Ground. Yeah. Like, I was down here, I called Kid Dog, I got a mean ass song. What, 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 what it's called? Scrub the Ground. He was like, Dog, we thought about the same shit. Yeah. So that's how Scrub the Ground came about. Really, Scrub the Ground came about because we said Scrub the Ground and shake that ass. That was, that was just a little chant. Let me see you scrub the grind. So we're like, damn, that's a motherfucking hit right there. 
disco red took me to the Rolex and I was only like 16. And I went in there and I saw this chick named Swade and she was doing this dance and all these magic tricks and I'm 16. So I ran home and I wrote work that coochie from seeing Shorty at the Rolex at that time. And then I came to Bob, I didn't have the beat. And I was like, Bob, this is how the song goes. And I like goes, I mean, he said, work in, you know, exactly. And I told him the lyrics and he was like, he liked it. My DJ at that time was Chuck G and Ray Lowe from them damn dogs. We was a little group. Um, Chuck did an original work that coochie beat. So the beat was already done by Chuck G. All Kid did was add a little 808 to it and segment the beat. But Chuck did the original. So went in there, got work that coochie signed to cut it up deaf. Um, about three weeks later, brought Sean and Head in from Splat Pack and got them signed to cut it up deaf for Shake That Ass. The junior high school, first day of school, I go in the lunchroom, and they're banging, rapping on the tables, banging on the tables. I'm like, oh, I could do that. So it's like, let me get in. He let me in. I rap. It's like, you can rap. Yeah. So one guy says, uh, I live next door to two live crew. The light goes off. So I go over the next day. They're there. And I went every day, every day. They were all living there in the same house? In the same house was... Uh, it was Kid Ice, Fresh Kid Ice, Brother Marquise and Mr. Mix. They were in the same place, so. I just would sit out of the way and observe, and I was there when, you know, a lot of the songs came up. So a lot of the songs that came about, I was the kid over sitting to the side. And then uh, shortly after that, me and Mr. Mix, we hook up. He comes up with his beat, and, you know, it's everybody say, yeah, beat. Around that time, they had just finished Move Something. Uh, everybody said, yeah, beat was uh, in the mix of that. And he played it for me. He gave it to me on the cassette. It's like, hey, take this and, you know, write a song to it. I got into writing. I wasn't a writer. I would just freestyle and make it up out of my head. But I, um, I'm looking around the house for different ideas, things like that. And I go through the TV guide and I see the littlest outlaw in the movie section. So I sat at the kitchen table. I'm an outlaw, outdoing everybody. That's how it came about. We had actually discovered this studio in Davie, Florida, you know, uh, called Hideaway Studio, uh, a guy by the name of Jimmy Starr. Uh, and we would go over there and uh, we could lay the beats at Jimmy's. I mean, he had everything we needed. Sampled the uh, guitar riff from Hey, We Want Some Pussy. And uh, came up with that little da 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 It allowed me to record it. And I uh, used to hang out at this, uh, I don't know, uh, if you know Aventura, Florida. It's not known for booty music that I know of or anything like that, but uh, there was a place called Randolph's at Lomans Plaza. And that's where I got the idea for that hook. When I say chicken, you say head. I knew Luke and them had hooks like that, you know, call and response type deals. Just lucked out with that little riff. Did it all at Hideaway. Ended up playing it for Stevie. Um, I was thinking it, at best, Chicken Head would be a B-side. And I had another song called Get Up and Dance, uh, which later became a song called It Ain't a Crime. And uh, that was really what I was pushing to him. He was like, nah, man, this your hit right here, this your hit. And he was calling out Chicken Head. Uh, so he came to Hideaway. It was the first time he met uh, Jimmy Starr. Played a little bass riff and added some claps. I mean, he was clapping me to death. He said, man, just, you gotta have an open mind. I was like, all right, my mind's open. My understanding is he played it for Funky Frank at Power 96 at a gas station. And uh, they put it in one of those Battle of the Bands and we were like number one for seven nights straight. And uh, I didn't even know they were playing it on the record until one of my boys came by, hey man, did you hear? I was like, did I hear what? He said, he knows, he knows. I was like, what the fuck do I know? I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're like, dude, they played your record on Power 96. And, and I remember that was like uh, a turning point for me. You know, People would actually ride out to the ranches and pick me up and hang out, you know. My life changed that day. In Puerto Rico, I did. I lived in a place called Calle, um, and I guess I was one of the only rappers there, but I guess being 15 or 16 years old, that's a way to get respect at the time. Was to battle people. I was immediately looking to battle whoever I could battle in order to get a name for myself. I guess the first thing on the agenda was to pick out some sort of nickname well, I said, I'm from Chicago. It's breezy over there. So I said, I'm going to be breezy. It's got to be a little deeper than that. I added the beat and I added the MC. So breezy beat MC came to pass. 
me and my DJ Dave, uh, Dave, Dave might have been responsible for introducing me to Breezy. We started doing some production for him. And out of those efforts came, you know, his hit record. Um, what was that song called? Shake the Joint. Yeah, Shake the Joint, that's what it was. We did the original production on it. The beat, Dave did all the scratches, you know, Jack, one of my father's uh, classic records, you know, and spun that. It was a real fun thing. It was like, man, you know, we're gonna kinda, we'll get into some production, we'll hook somebody up, who knows, man, we can turn this into something, and uh, it turned into something other than what we expected. By way, I believe a friend of mine, John Bianco, he introduced me to Claudio, like Debonair. We went to his house, Debonair heard the song, he fell in love with it, he thought it was a great idea. We recreated it and we went to the studio again. Jimmy Starr's Hideaway, I redid the vocals. Nasty put the cuts on Shake the Joint and on Catch My Drift. Long story short, I, I, I took the record and um, I gave it to my buddy Laz and Laz went ahead and he fell in love with it and he spun it. And I'm sure he was the first guy to spin Shake the Joint on the radio. I think next time I heard it, it was on the radio. I was like, damn, sounds a little like what we did. I mean. He SP-1200 it up, but you know, basically the same track. Um, I was driving home from the Broward Mall, and I remember like hearing it come on and pulling off to the side of the road, and, uh, and I started to cry. <laughs> when my director got your girlfriend came about, um, when I was in, in the, at the Art Institute, I was back in 88, uh, 89. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I met up with this guy uh, named Danny Spawn, AKA uh, Dan D. He wanted to get some samples. He had this, this SB12 back then. Mm -hmm. Not the 1200, he had the one with the big floppy disk. Mm -hmm. And I had a, <laughs> I had a, what they call a rolling 909. Right, right, right. And he, he really liked that kick. So he came in the studio one day and brought the SB12 in there. And we talked a little bit and, you know, I gave some samples off the 909. And you know, we started collaborating in as far as you know, we started talking about music. So one day he came into the studio, he had this idea, he said he was just driving and uh, it came to him and he was like, wow, boom, I got the girlfriend. He said it just popped in his head. But long story short, we recorded the, the song in the studio that day. And Danny uh, had some connections with the guy from Heatwave Records in California. David Williams was distributing for Beware Records. Ooh, wow. And he decided that um, he liked the song, wanted to sign us, and brought us out to California. Uh, the song was doing pretty good. We toured out there a little bit out in California. And then uh, all of a sudden, uh, they decided, let's do a follow up record with a girl version. We were looking around for a girl, looking around, you know, trying out different rappers, uh, female rappers. And I could say, hey, wait a minute, I have a cousin. I described her. She's basically what everybody was looking for. We actually had to record the vocals and she actually listened to, to us, you know, our voices and memorized it. Went back in the studio, we laid the tracks on her and that's kind of how it took off. And all of a sudden, um, that song did a lot better than the version that we did. I happened to hear their song on the radio first. And I was like, one day a girl should do that answer record because back then answer records were the thing. And next thing you know, it was me who did that song. So that's how I got started. And that's how I did Boom, I Got Your Boyfriend. I really didn't expect that it would overshadow Boom, I Got Your um, Girlfriend because Danny and um, the boys from the bottom, they were actually out doing their thing and Danny was supposed to do a video to Boom, I Got Your Girlfriend. But instead, that didn't happen for whatever reason or the other. And then, um, I don't know, it blew up. Once we got a major distribution deal through Avenue, the song blew up all over again because the song originally came out in 1989. And then when we got the bigger distribution through Avenue, it came out again in 1991. So technically it came out in the South first and then it went nationwide all over the world. Well, I think we first made Ride Out together. Yeah, Ride yeah. Out. After yeah. we did Ride Out, I said, Hold on, I got another track that's just crazy. Yeah. I put a Daz band on 45 and we came up with Run Forest Run. Run Forest Run, yeah, from the movie. We were watching uh, yeah. the movie Forest Gump or so yeah. we was laughing about it. And then that thing just took off. It no. sold a lot of records and I still ain't got my royalties yet. Yeah, we, we got to deal with our priority records. Yeah. Well, priority, y'all need this, you know. I know y'all went bankrupt, chapter 13, but woo we, I still ain't getting The only money I got from that was from you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I probably yeah, ain't yeah. charge you enough. Yeah. <laughs> I probably ain't charge that dude enough. Yeah. My goal was to uh, get on a jam on it. 
how do I get a song on a jam pony tape? tape? Yeah. That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hanging out with uh, Big Ace and Jam Pony Lock, job watching them cats. I'm like, how do I, how, can y'all make take one of my records and then, uh, yeah. And uh, run for his run. Yeah. They would start Mike Spare run for his run. They was Mike checking it. Yeah, I remember I was hanging out on Fort Lauderdale Beach uh, with some friends. We were just hanging out in this car cruise by, and they, they was playing uh, Ride Out. And I was, and they stopped at a light. We were standing there, um, and all you can hear is Ride Out. Yeah, uh, Sleek Big Mike checking Ride Out. I'm like, that's us. Like, we knew we were successful. There. Yeah. <laughs> hey, shout out to Jimmy Starr, man. A lot of us spent a lot of time in Hideaway Studio. Um, Jimmy Starr was the man. He was our, our circle house. He was yeah. our... Jimmy Starr was the man. Right? Yeah. He's still around doing this thing. What's up, y'all? My name is Jimmy Starr. This is Hideaway Recording Studio. This is where a lot of the bass hits were done back in the day. Come and check it out. The, you know, the stump at the Apollo Theater that you rub? That was kind of like me back in the day in here, you know? What Anything? Huh? What did they rub? Oh, well, they didn't rub anything. It was just the vibe. I got the same aura. Yeah, a lot of the hits back in the day were done in here. Apple we can give it all you got. Uh, DJ Laz, Oye Morena, MC Zeus, Breezy Beat. A lot of Fresh Kid Ice stuff done in here. Luis Diaz, the Diaz brothers. Uh, Luis started in here as a rock and roll drummer uh, when he was about 15, 16 years old. As Jim Johnson uh, started in here. He was a DJ called uh, DJ Jealous J. He was Jealous J back in the day and he cut it up pretty good on that table over there. Luis Diaz, like I said, he was a rock and roll drummer and uh, he kind of asked me, you know, hey, I want to get into this engineering thing and I believe I told him to go to Miami-Dade uh, Junior College. I knew they had a good program. So he went down there and uh, bam, he, uh, he is what he is today. Back in the day, it was only eight tracks. I had an eight track mixing console and we simped it up uh, with the SP-1200 and uh, literally through the three and a half minutes, there was five guys in there. Phil Jones from Power 96 helped us too. Uh, and there was marks all over the sliders and the knobs. And halfway through the song, you'd turn it up and pan it to the left and then bring it down to the next mark at two minutes and pan it to the right. And just crazy stuff like that back in the day. And if you messed up, you had to start all over again. And uh, it was printed uh, on that reel-to-reel -reel machine behind me. You give it all you got, uh, run for us, run. All that, oh yeah, Marina, all, all them were done on on this two track. Uh, I got some antique speakers. I don't even know how old these speakers are, but that was an important part of my mixing technique uh, back in the day. And these will knock your socks off. Uh, if you crank them up, they'll knock you backwards. But before it was on a tape, it was a quarter inch tape or half inch tape, two track stereo. Once I get the reel to reel tape, quarter inch or half inch, from the studio, it's up to me to retweak it because from the studio, it's not really up to standards for radio. It's usually what's called flat. So according to what kind of music it is, whether it's bass or just uh, uh, it's a disco back then, or, uh, or a cello with a piano is how I EQ. And I do, I put all the compression and the limiters and all that technical stuff. What I have here is an actual test cut of a record. This is a lacquer and I have it under a microscope. And you can actually see the grooves. The black lines are the grooves of the record. The vibration is the audio itself, which your record player plays back. Because the needle that drops on your record player will actually vibrate according to these vibrations. And then your amplifier amplifies those vibrations. This example that I'm showing is, I can tell it's very soft music. I have to be very, very careful when I'm mastering those bass records because the grooves are very, very wide. And that's because of the bass itself. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of electronic sounds try to, trying to imitate the 808. Right. And when I master a CD nowadays, I can tell they're trying to imitate it, but that's all they're doing, trying. You can't get that 808 sound the way that 808 brings it. At the age, I think, of 19, my brother started a label with uh, Danny Canary. So, you know, me being the little brother, you know, of course, I was there all the time and never really at school, you know, skipping school, going to the studio every day. Um, so they started a label and they signed a group called Real Raw. Okay, so then we're sitting there, you know, blah, blah. I'm just, you know, I'm a little kid at this point, you know, I'm just observing what's going on. I have no idea, you know, really 
the magnitude of what's happening, you know? I showed up to the studio and they were like, um, this is the single we're gonna put out. You know, it's called Drop Them Drop. Press stupid deal and it's down by law. We got a brand new dance called Drop Them Draw. My brother goes, you know, he stopped the, the half inch eight track, you know, that everybody was working on. And he was like, what do you think? And I'm like, honestly? And he's like, yeah. I go, I think it's horrible. <laughs> He's like, why? I'm like, cause it, you know the way they were, I guess the way they approached the beat at that time really wasn't like what was going on with Luke and Come On Baby at that time was really hot and all that stuff. So he's like, well, why? Cause it needs to sound like this. And I pulled out Come On Baby and I played it. And you know my brother was like, oh, wow, okay, I see what's going on. You know what I mean? So scratched the whole beat. We just kept the vocals and rebuilt the whole song. You know, uh, modeling after the Come On Baby record. See, with the Real Raw project, that was still kind of Miami ghetto base, and I was more on the whole freestyle electronic vibe. That's what I was digging. I was digging. I, but I, my goal was to mesh this freestyle sound that I'm hearing and this 808 drum machine. This is what I wanted to do. Okay, I wasn't hearing that in Planet Rock. I wasn't hearing that in any of this stuff. They were all using Lindrum stuff. So I was working on my little side thing that I was doing. Was that uh, plant, uh, Power Patrol? That was, yes, I was the beginnings of the Power Patrol stuff. But it wasn't even Power Patrol, there was no Demas Martinez, no Curtis Lehman, no, no Luis Diaz. This is just me fucking around in the studio. Can I say fucking around? Moments in Bass turned out to be like a B-side record that actually carried the A-side record. It turned out to be a very successful record. Um, that was, that was, um, that was on the flip side of Hump All Night. She's the kind of girl that wants to hump on. And that was the that was the A side of the record. The B side was Moments in Bass. And um, that was just something that I was fucking around with in the studio and Lazaro needed fillers. So I was, you know, let's do it. And a lot of the, all the musical stuff that Lazaro's got, all the tracks, the, the Red Alert, um, Turning Into Bass, that's the, all the musical stuff that he's got. Not the ghetto bass stuff, but the musical stuff is all, the, all, all my contributions to the album. I wasn't really happy with my credits on the album. I got keyboard credits on these albums. I, I co-produced these albums. I, if not more, more so produced them with Danny D more so than Lazaro. And Eric was different. Eric was very outgoing. He was direct in your face. He says, can you rap? Let me hear you now. And this is over the phone. So I did my best rendition of what I thought at the point, that particular time, a female LL Cool J would sound like. And he liked it. And the rest is history. From there, we cut Make It Mellow. It was placed on uh, Bay Station Records. Um, it's horrible to say that Noberto was shortly uh, murdered after that. We then did Get In Bass. I was the first female rap artist to uh, actually score a six-figure deal. I had a publishing deal, and it it made actually it made Newsweek magazine. We were really shrewd, and we knew what we wanted, and we went for it. Needless to say, Miami at that point in time was not really um, looked upon as real rap. I'm from New York, from the Bronx, New York, and people in New York used to call it corny rapping. Anything from the South was corny, but we knew that we had something original. We decided to get in a talent show. I don't know what made us get in a talent show, but Clay Deedy, he was down there and he heard our music and that's how we got started on that. And he said, I got some beats. He said, you think y'all can do something with them? Remember? And he gave us the CD. He dropped us off home. Oh, he actually gave us the idea to write the word. It, that that what was going on around at the time. And our manager, Nathan Moss, he was like the big trickster. So we knew what to write about. And you know, I'm executive producer of Breakaway Records. Clay D one day, he said, I got some girls. We was at the club. And Clay D is like, boom, I got your boyfriend. He said, I got the answer to that song. I said, yeah, I want to meet those girls. It ain't took but a matter of seconds once I heard that the record, it blew me away. 15, 20 minutes. Clay D actually left us. He was like, all right, y'all think y'all find something to write about? He actually hadn't even gotten home. And we called him, he was like, hey. Yeah, we were finished. We He's like, finished. you gotta be kidding. I said, I think you're gonna like this. <laughs> he came right back. 
Turn around. He listened to the to the taste. <laughs> Is and hey! <laughs> Yo, you tuned in to Charles Trahan right now from the former group Young and Restless. Also, aka the real one. And now I go by the name of Mr. Charlie. But we're gonna start back in the days when I first started out with the Miami bass. Music, it was uh I met a dude named Lenaris Johnson in high school, and we met P-Man Sam. You know, we used to bother him at the base station. It was a, a club that he used to run, and um, he always knew we wanted to rap. So he said, you know, if y'all really want a record deal, I want y'all to battle this group here. So it was like a spontaneous thing right on the spot, and we beat the group. And um, next day, it took about a month for him to come see us. So about a month later, we end up meeting back up with him. And um, he introduced us to Eric Griffin, R.I.P., who was the producer at that time. And um, he made us a, a, a beat that had an original uh, group, the Coasters, called Poison Ivy. And he had it sampled in there, and um, he had this paper all ready for us to do the rap. And it was singing on that. He wanted to sing like, I know a girl named Trudy. And then wanted me to say, not Trudy, got that booty. So we looked at Sam like, man, we don't want to sing, we want to rap. But, you know, at that time, you know, we didn't understand the importance of having a producer. So we ended up singing a song and, you know, next thing you know, it just blew up overnight. So after that, we made also in the studio and did a song called B-Girls and Lenora's Road. And um, the song just had the same effect. It just it just blew up and took off. We started doing shows and, and it's like it was an overnight success. We went on tour with Public Enemy, Kid and Play, Tupac. And uh, we was hanging with Tupac on the tour, uh, Ice Cube, you name it. So it was a, a success, like just like an overnight success. Along with basic production, more intricate forms of editing existed. Yeah, um, so me and Ron used to hang together. We used to just hang, so we became like really good friends. And um, actually, he was, he was one of my best friends to this day. And. Um, and then me and Ron, I taught Ron a little, I taught Ron how to edit. And then, cause I had got my, I got a reel to reel at home. I showed him how to edit. He showed Wayne how to edit. And then he put us together and he was like, I'll manage you guys. It just wasn't like, I'm gonna put you guys together. And I'm gonna manage you. It just sort of happened. It was like, or, it was really organic. It just, just happened. Uh, basically editing is when you, you know, you record your song and a rhythm to, to tape. And then you mark your tape and uh, you're actually cutting the, the tape to create a different rhythm out of what you've recorded. So it's like, the, that's how you get the stutter step and different uh, edit effect. And I guess I learned that from being on the radio stations, just being around the studio a lot. It was part of the, the music production process. Kevin Flournoy, uh, Phil Jones, Bob Rosenberg, some of the people that showed me how to edit, definitely. The first time I seen somebody do it was, was Phil Jones. And once I seen it, I was like, I knew I was going to be doing that. I knew that's something I was going to be getting into. I didn't know how, but I knew I was going to be getting into it. I think security was a growth spurt for the uh, whole Miami bass sound, you know. I did some scratches on there and editing work, which kind of enhanced it a little more and gave it a little edge over a lot of other songs that were out at the time. Yeah, you know, Beat Club. Yeah, that was probably, that was a big record, man. After its popularity and people were telling me, oh, how big it was as an international song and in Europe and different areas in Germany and, uh, when I told people I worked on that song, you know, I got a lot of surprise looks. And it felt good, you know. And that song got picked up on Atlantic Records, so it was cool. Yeah, it got picked up on Atlantic, but anything that, at the time, that was big in South Florida, Atlantic, you remember Atlantic was signing everything. One of the deepest lows that I've ever experienced was the separation of Magic Mike and myself. He's a dude who I admired, I looked up to. He was older than me. He shielded me from a lot of things. He showed me a lot of things about the business, about the industry. Ultimately, what transpired was there was an incident where Mike did cuts on the Chilla Frost record. Mike was supposed to get it paid. Everything was supposed to be what it was. Basically, Clay told the people at the label that he owned Mike. 
That's what it was. Mike was like, man, I ain't owned by nobody. No label, no artist, no producer, nobody. You know what I'm saying? He, he came to me and he was like, yo, Rob, man, I'm about to break out on this, man. I'm not feeling this. You know what I'm saying? And I want you to come with me. The one thing he really never understood was as a 15 year old child, you know what I'm saying? I'm at a point where I'm doing what I always wanted to do in life. And now he's telling me to give this all up and he has nowhere for us to go. You understand me? Faced in that plight, I did what I felt I needed to do for me as an artist. And I made the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate decision to stay with Clay. But again, you know what I'm saying, Mike, I ain't never had nothing but love for you. You my dude, always will be regardless. You know what I'm saying? Salute to you, bro. I appreciate all you did do for me. Bass music continues to influence new generations of artists and producers. Back in the 80s, there was a club called Weekends in Boca Raton, Florida, uh, home of Jealous J, Shafi, Exotic E. A lot of the boys came from there. Uh, Eddie B, Johnny Quest. Um, we all hung around each other. We all did music. MC Gemini, my school alumni. Fast forward a couple years later, this guy, MC Romeo, was looking for producers. And um, somehow we ended up being recommended to him. That, uh, you know, this guy Aaron, nobody really knows about him, but he's really good with music. Uh, so he came to me and said he had an idea for a song. He was trying to tap into that Tampa, Orlando uh, feel of Miami music. Went to Hideaway Studios with Jimmy Starr. Um, told Jimmy what I was looking for and we uh, put the record together. Actually, it kind of backtracked and went to Jealous Jay. And um, kind of pulled me in to work with him with Paper Chasers on, you know, as an in-house producer and just kind of stayed in the background on the scene from that point. In the year 2004, I did a song called City of Bass. And what I did when I created that is I was like, if I was producing music during the heyday of Miami Bass, what would I have done? Bass 808 from day one until now and always will be a part of my music. This right here, man. Right there, boy. This is what we love to do, Miami Bass. Chill. I think without DJ FX, Mega John, Juanito, you know, a tech master, there'd be no sound chasers. It wouldn't be. Our style is, is yeah. based off of a little bit of all, all of those guys. Uh, a lot of early uh, Dynamics too. Yeah. Magic Mike. Magic, Magic Mike. Mike. Yes, yeah, can't forget Magic Mike. Can't forget Mike. Magic Mike. It wasn't for Magic Mike, I wouldn't be here, bro. Uh, so I, I, when I say hip hop, it, it I was include Miami, Miami, Miami Bass. Hip hop. It's street music. It was oh, influenced. They were right. rapping. They were breaking. They were DJing. It's hip hop, but it's, it's the South version of hip hop yeah. because of the way they were living their life down here. Well, I remember hearing Bass Rock Express by MCADE, um, which is considered like probably one of the first Miami Bass records. Yeah, I think mine was Tro the D, and uh, we used to go to like a roller disco, which I later found out Phil used to DJ oh, yeah. at. And uh, I first heard Give the DJ a Break by Dynamix 2. I was like, wow, what's that? It's like the first tune with that massive line. Massive bass, multi-tone, multi-tone bass on it. Yeah, it's probably the first one that really got me excited about the whole genre. And that's when I knew I wanted to start making tracks like that. Now, let's take a journey deep down south to Brazil and meet the artists who crafted their own music based heavily on the Miami bass sound. Ele é pai do baile funk hoje, o baile funk carioca, o DJ Battery Brian, ele é, o, o, digamos que, ele é o pai do tamborzão. E por um acaso o, o Nas trouxe, né? Foi o Nas que trouxe pra cá, enfim, muita coisa, 95% do que tocou nos bares funk vinha através dele, né? Ele que trazia pra cá, ele que trazia essas músicas pra tocar aqui, isso influenciou gerações. Bass, my friend, people like bass. So I want the world to see this. These are all his negotiations back then, bringing down the bass history. The other thing, bass, bass in Miami. Wow. I'm the first Brazilian guy to buy in bass. 
in person. Whoa. Carl Jules Records do not exist anymore. Carlos died. He died. He yeah. died. He's great very, friend. Very well known in the music. Yeah. Industry. So they control the radio and decided to stop my base. Wow. Only play lyrics in Portuguese because they become rich. We start making money. Why play Miami Bay? So they destroy one movement. That movie, one million people. Weekend all over Brazil. I sell record for all over Brazil. So they stop this movement. But this music is so strong. The bass is so strong. Right. That survive everything. Right. Because the music that they do come from the bass. Mm -hmm. So they can't deny the bass. Right. E o Miami Bass, quando chegou aqui nos anos 80, ele era essa alegria. As pessoas tinham seus problemas, tinham suas dificuldades por morar em favela e nos finais de semana invadiam os bailes e a gente conseguia colocar aí um milhão de pessoas curtindo o Miami Bass. O Miami Bass, ele se encontrou dentro das favelas, ele se misturou com o candomblé, com músicas africanas, com tambores, e ele foi se transformando numa outra coisa. A música do Rio de Janeiro é o funk. E o funk de hoje veio do Miami Bass. Se hoje, hoje eu sou o que eu sou, graças a vocês que começaram isso lá atrás, lá na América, 10 mil quilômetros de distância, influenciaram a gente aqui. Valeu, obrigado. Meu nome é Cleston, aqui uh, é DJ Tom Oliver. Eu tenho uma banda, uma banda de rock no band Brasil, chamada Detonautas. And uh, have the Miami Bass influence because uh, I used to work in, uh, live in the uh, United States for eight years. I arrived in 1988 in New York. And uh, the first thing it, when I arrived in New York, I, go, I went to straight to the to record store to buy uh, all the, the Miami Bass records, like a Dynamic Shoe, Cutting Up Death. I have uh, like a five or six records, vinyl, single, Techno Trip. Uh, cut it up deaf, uh, uh, part, uh, part time. I have all this record because I really love I just bring this, uh, this record to my friends here in Brazil when they came back. I learned a, a lot of things with Magic Mike. Uh, here he's scratching. I was trying to do the same, but he's so good. He's very, very fast. He's good, right? The cut it up deaf the record. I was here, the, the scratching, the performance, what are you guys doing? Uh, Chuck G was so, so, so fast. I was trying to do the same and bring this to the, my band. I say thanks a lot to, to, to give this to us. It's a, appreciate, you know. E, e eu também tenho o um programa na, na Global Funk Radio, né? www.globalfunkradio.com uh -huh, uh -huh. E toda sexta-feira procuro sempre também tocar é, Miami Bass e Aliado. E as coisas novas, né? Porque sim, ele, sim. o Hugo, por exemplo, toca muita coisa nova dentro do estilo. Né? É, hoje é. e atual, né? Mantém Mantém o movimento. Dia. Porque existem coisas atuais. Exatamente. Né? Exatamente. 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 Então nós queremos ser que essa atualizada funcione. Isso aí. Artistas do hip hop. Brasileiro uh, com beats de Miami Bass. Que legal! Amos Larkin. <risos> Sally Derguel tocou muito aqui. Isso foi sucesso e não foi só nos bailes blacks. Foi em todos os bailes aqui. Oh, oh, oh. Sally Derguel. <risos> e no Rio de Janeiro, enquanto eles tocavam as músicas mais rápidas, aqui o pessoal tocava as músicas mais lentas. Então nós temos, por exemplo, no Rio de Janeiro, o single do True Love Crew, Throw the D. Ok? Throw the D. É tocado no Rio. E aqui em São Paulo nós tocávamos Ghetto Bass. Então é uma coisa muito bacana, aqui, DJ KJ MC Cool C, no Rio eu tocava Just Look and Listen, e em São Paulo eu tocávamos Shadow and Dona, então sempre houve essa diferenciação, o pessoal aqui de São Paulo curtia um som um pouquinho mais pesado e com os BPMs mais lentos, isso também influenciou de certa forma a com que houvesse uma diferenciação entre o que tocava no Rio de Janeiro que hoje é conhecido como o, o funk carioca, né? Uh, e o que toca aqui em São Paulo, que o pessoal rotula como hip hop, ok? 
took a trip, went over to Brazil, started doing my shows over there, the concerts and stuff, and it was, uh, I mean, the crowds were crazy, dude. I mean, it was, you know, I was doing soccer stadiums, four shows a night, massive crowds. I'm the only one performing, and it, it was it was just, it was crazy. And you guys ended up in Brazil. Right? Yes. Yeah. So how was that experience over there? That the was, whole culture and everything. Oh, the, 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 that was like one of the best experiences that, you know, we ever encountered. Yes. You know, we had over 20,000 people in a stadium, and we did like uh, two shows in one night. We had 20,000 on this side of town, then we drove another 45 minutes away or so, 30, 45 minutes, and we had a 5,000 people at another spot. So it was like unbelievable. I remember one of my first memories of Miami is being here, uh, right when I first moved in here, I was just like laying on a tube in, in a wave pool at Six Flags Atlantis in Miami and just watching like DJ Laz, Phil Money Jones, some of these guys cutting it up and I was just looking up there and I'm just like, man, this is insane. All the people in Miami just loving it and these guys are just killing it um, on the cut. I've never seen scratching like that before and I'm just looking, I'm like, man, that's what I wanna do. I definitely wanna do that. Like, I love this music. I've just been like in love with scratching ever since. Days with Cut It Up Def, we saw Laz at Six Flags Atlantis. John Ski, the hustler he is from New York, he got us in, we didn't pay to get in. We walked right through the gates of Atlantis, walked right up to like DJ Laz. Right there. He handed him, the gates of Atlantis. Handed him a copy of <laughs> Cut It Up Death. Laz pulled that record out, looked at it, put it on the turntable, listened to it, looked at us and went like that. Well, no, first he yes, wanted to Those first days are done. First he yeah, put it back in his ever again. Everybody used to bring me their, their booty records. Yo, let's see if I can get Laz to play this on, uh, on the radio. Or let's see if I can get Laz to play this at Six Flags Atlantis. That was like the... Uh, the ultimate parties on Friday night, everybody would show up. Everybody would come up and, and that was like the test to see if the record was dope. I'd pop it in the headphones, I'd listen to it, I'd be like, yeah, this record's going in right now. Boom! And cut it in. This is back in like 80, 88, 89. Those, those yeah. days are done, those days are done. We had just pressed We Could Get Together. So we brought it, I got up on stage, somebody let us on stage. I think Mike Jewish, you know, convinced them to let us up there. So we got oh, up yeah. there and I asked Laz if he could play it. And Laz is like, well, I, we're on the radio live. I can't just play something. I, uh, you know, but he he played it in his in the headphones. He listened to it, he liked it, and boom, do it right on the radio. Yeah, bro. And, and, and after that, I was, I was waiting for that day and I was in the car with my old manager and Mike Jewish and all, we're driving around I'm like, you know what? I can't wait for that day to where I just hear it. Not where I'm asking somebody to play it, but I just hear it. Fucking five minutes after that on the friggin' radio, and we're like, holy shit. Yeah, but the, the reason why I brought that all, all up is because he did really, he broke the record. Last was the record. Last was the red alert of Miami Bass. <laughs> and just like the old days, modern day pirates took advantage of many bass artists. It was fucked up. They shitted on artists, man. You know what I'm saying? If you didn't really understand the business, a lot of artists that came from my genre of music were literally taken advantage of. And I'm gonna put that out there. That needs to be heard. Because I definitely don't want to fuck anybody the way I got fucked at the beginning. My first royalty check, and I remember it perfectly, was 35 cents. Next time, buy me a fucking soda. Don't send me a check for 35 cents. People in the, in the administrative or the executive or corporate side of music had absolutely no respect for artists. Right. I got it right on paper. My older brother used to always tell me, man, if it ain't right on paper, it ain't right. right. Who's got money for a lawyer back then? Who's Who did? Who did? Who did? Who did? Who did? Who did? As far as the up-tempo stuff, um, South Florida has always had up-tempo music. Party. It's the party. Even when I was a kid and it was R&B stuff, you know, if it was a national hit that was da da da, fine, great. It might have been top ten or whatever. Down here, if the B-side was faster, that's, that's what people were dancing to. Blow up. Yep. In the clubs, in the streets. Yep. What do you think? It's the heat, the sex drive. What is it? I think it's the heat. Partially the red light district and, and the, you know, this, this, the strip clubs and the heat keeps everything at a faster pace, of it, if I'm making any sense. The tropics. Well, the, the tropics. Let's just call it the tropics. The tropics, well, because the it's, 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 it's that way with everything else. It's not just the music, it's sports. Well, yeah, well, Will I Am, he's, he's just heavily influenced by the Miami bass sound. So, you know, I mean, he samples, uh, he uses, you know, like fix it in the mix and and of course he went and took the Afro Rican, you know, borrows, you know, the, that vibe for their record. So to me, everything stems or comes from 
And if you're gonna get a tempo up to like 120, 130, you're talking, you're probably talking Miami bass. You know, I always thought like, uh, even if I didn't get to be the artist, I'd like to be behind the artist, you know, doing some production or something like that. But fuck it, I wouldn't mind getting behind the mic. You know, maybe not this late at night. So I sound a little raspy, real sexy. 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 Live on the night beat. Live on the night beat. <laughs> fuck that. I wanna take you to my house. <laughs> Um, getting in the music business again and never knowing where you're going to end up. For me, I always feel like do it from the heart and whatever comes out of it is always right. It's your therapy. So, you know, when you get a, you know, a trophy like, you know, a, a, a platinum plaque or something like this from, from Fergie from a record label, it is to me, besides the money, is one of those things that says that you've been recognized for something that you've created. At the end of the day, it all started for me making bass music. Bass music, it was one, uh, 128 to 140, and now all the uh, rap records now, it's 140, but they put it half time, so it's a 70, you know? And so it's still a bass music, but and they're putting the snare on the other on, on the instead, one, on every second one. Of, yeah. yeah. And also they're tricking out the hi hats. They're yes. also using a lot of the snare rolls like we used to do back in the bass yes. with the the octaves and do, 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 they're yes. using a lot of that stuff. So basically it's still around. Yes, it is. It's still it's, relevant, right? It's very relevant and you know that's one thing I always tell people these days. It's like in today's market, most of the records these people are hearing is bass music. Mr. Mix. He, he did a, a big part uh, when we was running uh, real good. So he put everything together with the bass music, I would say that. On the walls you notice beautiful plaques. Boy Usher, a couple million sold there. A couple million for Lil Wayne. A couple, couple, couple million for Beyonce. And right behind me is Nelly. And the B.O.B. was at the top of the stairs. Jamie Foxx, Trick Daddy. And you saw the little Wayne, Beyonce, Usher, T.I. So that's what I'm doing now. Peanut Butter Jelly was a dance that was just popular in Miami amongst the kids and whatnot. So this is when Trick Daddy was popular, he was doing his thing. He did a show on BET and he was going over Shut Up talking about Peanut Butter Jelly. And he was representing hard for the Crips. So Chip went home, put some loops together, came up with it, peanut butter jelly. So here we got a song. So I'm like, all right. So we start playing the shit, it's real popular. We put it on mix CDs. So all of a sudden, you know, we flipping through the radio stations and Power 96 is playing it. And I'm like, damn, man, this must be a mistake or they must have played it by accident. They ain't gonna play no Booty Shake song in 2001 at, or in the morning or at night. And we just originally made the song for us to DJ with, just something for us to have, because nobody wasn't making no real Miami records no more like that. Everything was, they trying to do what Atlanta was doing. They, was, they wasn't trying to be Miami no more. We went to Amadal Oscar studio, took us an hour and a half, put the shit down, jammed on it, and all we doing is mic checking, jamming on it. The bitch can say what they want. We made probably the last authentic Miami song that was whamming on the radio, clubs, everywhere. Peanut butter jelly was everywhere. What, what was that crazy with other peanut butter and, and yeah peanut butter jelly? You remember that piece of BS record that you, that you broke that too? So it was real cool. Nick um Nick put us on. We had a deal with Slip and Slide Records. Then Luke came in and he tried to he tried to get it from Chipman. So it, it was a mess and ain't no need to go through all the mess. But um everybody prospered from it. Everybody got some money from it. Man, what time is it? Ain't about a jelly time, we did our time with it. The booming bass sound is now a global musical phenomenon. It's peanut butter jelly time, peanut butter jelly time, peanut butter jelly time. Way yet, way yet, way yet, way yet. Peanut butter jelly, peanut butter jelly, peanut butter jelly with a baseball bat. Everybody knows somebody that knows somebody that knows something about it. I'm straight out the county of days, nigga, that's my head. Can you feel that?
that B A S S B. But I know y'all wanted that 808. Can you feel that B A S S B? It was terrible. I loved it. Get him off. More. 